Hi, everyone. The last couple of years has been a torrid time for most of us. With COVID-19 leaving us all devastated. If you look at the count, 4.7 lakhs of people have died in India alone. And if you look at the global toll, more than 5 million people have died. Not only does COVID-19 cause such high mortality, the survivors are left very often with disabling symptoms. And when these people come for anesthetic management, be it for elective or emergency surgery, the anesthetists often face a conundrum and they would probably need to modify care in the face of the symptoms that these patients may have. Several organ systems are affected and COVID-19 doesn't spare any particular organ system. So these symptoms that you find in patients who recover from COVID, which persists for a variable period of time, often lasting several weeks or several months, has been collectively termed the long COVID syndrome or the post-acute sicile of COVID. We are all worried about what goes on in the brain and COVID-19 particularly affects the brain in several ways. Mild symptoms, headache, dizziness, anosmia is a fairly common symptom. And in many patients, it takes a very long time to resolve. Encephalitis and seizures are not uncommon in severe COVID. And you can get a severe demyelinating polyneuropathy of the guillain barre type. And in this situation, the anesthetists need to be particularly diligent as it might result in an exaggerated response to neuromuscular blockers. You will need to take particular care to ensure that you monitor neuromuscular blockade intraoperatively and ensure that they are adequately reversed before you extubate them and transfer them to the board or ICU as the case may be. I remember one of the patients in the early stage of the first wave that we had was a 47 year old man who presented us to us with what looked like a simple straightforward stroke. And he had a CT like this with involvement of the left middle cerebral artery territory and a right hemiplegia. He went on to develop lung infiltrates, symptoms fairly typical of COVID ended up getting ventilated. So that was one of the first cases of stroke that we saw and subsequently we've seen several more over time. So COVID-19 can present as stroke and can leave significant residual disability as well. I was reviewing the in impact of COVID-19 on the psychiatric, neuropsychiatric symptoms in the last couple of days. And there are many psychiatric symptoms that these patients may experience during the recovery phase, which include anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder is fairly common in COVID. Psychological distress and stress-related problems are also particularly common. The brain fog syndrome is commonly described, characterized by inability to focus, forgetfulness and confusion. So all these problems can have implications for the anesthetist. You need to particularly warn them that they may be significantly worse after surgery and be ready to face it and, me, and be ready for a, a long period of rehabilitation with neuropsychiatric involvement as required. One of the problems that we saw during the course of both the waves, in fact, is severe neuromuscular weakness in many of these patients, even in young patients in their 20s and 30s, even after they recover from the severe ARDS, even after the oxygenation improves, even after they start breathing spontaneously on pressure support, they remain profoundly weak. Some of them with not even a flicker of movement in their muscles. This has been a very common phenomenon and it takes a very long time to recover.
and they spend weeks, sometimes even months at the end of a tracheostomy tube and get rehabilitated. One of the reasons I feel for this is the extensive use of muscle relaxants that we use for these patients. We've used so much of muscle relaxants for several weeks together. Many of these patients are prone ventilated for a, a very long period of time. And that entails the use of very high doses of neuromuscular blockers over a very long period of time, which results in muscle atrophy, diaphragmatic dysfunction, and significant inability to lean off ventilator support. And some of these patients can be a real challenge to the anesthetists when they present for surgery later on. Particularly concerning is the diaphragmatic dysfunction, which delays weaning from ventilation. The white band that you see there is the thickness of the diaphragm as seen with a 12 megahertz high frequency probe. And that's the baseline contraction of the diaphragm. Normally, when you take a deep breath in, in fact, this is my own diaphragm, which I have captured on ultrasound, you see the white band extends from its baseline to something like this, which is normal diaphragmatic function. However, look at the patient with COVID who has just recovered from my RDS. The white band that you see here is the diaphragmatic thickness at baseline. And during inspiration, you hardly see any thickening at all. This reveals a profound diaphragmatic weakness. And this patient, you can rest assured, will require a very long period of weaning and recuperation. I'll just show you a movie clip. That's the normal thickness of the diaphragm. As you breathe in, it thickens. But look at this COVID patient. You can't even figure out if he is breathing in or out because the diaphragmatic thickness remains unchanged. So in these patients, when they come for elective surgery or emergency surgery, when they have profound neuromuscular weakness, you should be careful with the use of neuromuscular blocking drugs. And it's an important point to ensure that you monitor neuromuscular blockade, which is we don't do very often in simple, straightforward cases. But in these patients, it may be very crucial to monitor neuromuscular blockade, ensure that you do not overdose them. They can get very easily overdosed. And particularly in patients who've been bedridden for a long time, rhabdomyolysis may be a common phenomenon. And the use of succinylcholine particularly may not be appropriate. Of course, sucks is not very commonly used these days among anesthetists I know. You should be careful you should think twice before you use depolarizing muscle relaxants in this situation. And it's always important to look back on the neurological history, like in the case that we mentioned who had the stroke. Review the history, go through their files, and review the images, including CT and MRI scans, if they had been done to ensure, to make sure that you know what's going on. Are there any residual disabilities? And do we need to modify the care based on these findings? One of the patients that we had at the beginning of the pandemic, in fact, the very first patient was a young man. I still remember him. He was a 36-year-old who came with acute myocardial infarction, it looked like a lady territory infarct, the testy elevation in the anterior leads. At that time, we had no clue as to how to handle this. We were not even sure at that time about the mode of transmission of COVID-19. We were not sure about what kind of precautions you need to take. And if you do angiography, how do you handle it? None of these questions were satisfactorily answered. And our cardio cardiologists, understandably, were reluctant to take him up for angiography. So this man, unfortunately, deteriorated before we could figure out what best to do for him, he developed cardiogenic shock with severe LV dysfunction and he was dead 
in less than 48 hours. So acute ischemia may be the presenting manifestation of COVID-19, and that might lead them with a profoundly impaired LV function, even in youngsters. In fact, MRI studies of the heart have shown, in this particular study, they looked at 26 patients, and they found even in patients who didn't have much symptoms, there was evidence of myocardial edema, fibrosis, and in addition to LV dysfunction, the right ventricular function may also be impaired. So that's something that you need to keep in mind in COVID survivors. There may be a significant left ventricular dysfunction that may not be obvious clinically, and you may have to look at it in greater detail with echocardiography. COVID did not spare even the youngsters. Even though the incidence of severe COVID was lower among women, we came across several young women who had very bad disease, and the lung was uniformly involved in a, a very significant manner. This young girl, 18 years old, she came with profound hypoxia, and she was almost left for dead because she was saturating in her 50s in the prone position on 100% oxygen, and a CT scan looked like this from top to bottom. We persisted with her, proned her an umpteen number of times, and thankfully, she made a slow recovery. Things started improving, underwent tracheostomy, underwent continued ventilation, the total duration of ventilation was close to three months in the ICU. And then we were able to discharge her home, decannulated her, discharged her home. She was on home oxygen for another couple of months. And currently she is off the oxygen and, and reasonably okay in terms of physical function. So that's what it can do to even an 18 year old, 34 year old lady who presented with complete fight out of both the lungs. And on top of that, she blew a pneumothorax. We passed the chest tube and she seemed to be okay for the first couple of days. And then there was persisting air leak and she blew a pneumothorax yet again in, in the presence of the first tube. So we had to pass a second tube to relieve this pneumothorax. And at the time she was actually in dire straits. Her blood pressure was dropping. She was obviously in, in tension pneumothorax. And she was actually, although she was sedated, she was awake enough to ask me. She realized that something serious was happening. She asked me, doctor, will I die? So the, at the end of the tracheostomy tube, she indicated to me, is there any chance of me surviving? And I had to, console her and tell her there is every possibility that you may improve. And thankfully, she did in fact improve. Another long story, several months in hospital and a couple of months on home oxygen. And again, not completely normal at this time, but able to carry out reasonable physical activities. This gentleman, 46 years old, presented with a CT like this. And again, we thought he wouldn't make it. In fact, he was a close family member of one of our own consultants. And we were wondering whether we should offer him ECMO, but he came too late to us, well beyond the window period for ECMO. Time after time after time, he would fiddle with the ventilator, try to optimize beep, prone him, supine him, nothing seemed to change. But he too improved over time. He was able to be weaned off, went home, severe disability. He couldn't really walk very far. At the time of discharge, we did another CT on him. And this is what we found. There was a subplural emphysematous pulla sitting there, which looked very threatening to us at that point of time. But because he felt reasonably okay, there was not much of residual symptoms, we thought we would leave him alone. He stayed in Bangalore, close to the hospital, for a couple of weeks. And then he went back to his uh, a slightly rural part of the, the state. 
where the facilities are not all that great. But of course, we told the family that you should be very careful. This bulla may blow at any time and you might develop a pneumothorax. And then one evening, lo and behold, he became intensely breathless, obviously from a tension pneumothorax. Thankfully, they could take him to a nearby facility in a couple of hours time where they inserted a chest tube and saved his life. So the bottom line, of course, is to ensure that you assess the lung appropriately. Very important to realize that even if there may not be too many symptoms, even with minimal physical activity, many of these patients have significant residual damage, and that might actually cause problems during anesthesia, particularly with mechanical ventilation. So it's very important to evaluate them with lung function tests if appropriate, and perhaps even a CT scan to look at how much damage there is. And the extent of involvement is highly variable. The requirement for oxygenation is not always the best thing to go by. In fact, one of my own colleagues in ICU, she was a 39-year-old, developed fever, headache, minimal symptoms. The saturation was 98, 99% all the time. When we did a CT on her, there was some 30% involvement of the lung. So that's how it goes. Saturation may not always drop in some of these patients, especially youngsters. So you need to look closely, may even need to do imaging to see how much of involvement there is. Particularly if they undergo mechanical ventilation, they might blow a pneumothorax. Sudden unexplained hypoxia during the procedure, hypotension along with it should raise the trigger, should raise the alarm to seek a possible pneumothorax in such patients. And you must, of course, counsel them that they may well require post-operative ventilation if it's a long procedure. And they might end, end up in ICU and may require supportive care for an extended period of time. Needless to say, if at all it is possible, and if the procedure is not urgent, it's best to wait bide your time and wait for an appropriate time before you carry out elective procedures. And when you ventilate patients with restrictive lung disease secondary to COVID-19, there are several things that need to be borne in mind. Tidal volumes should be kept as low as possible. Six mils per kilogram would be appropriate. You should cut down on the ventilation pressures high pressures can result in trauma, particularly concerning uh, the sort of emphysematous bulla that may often see, as I showed in one of our own patients, which may blow up and can give you a severe pneumothorax. PEEP levels should be, again, kept to a minimum because, again, high PEEPs may be associated with more injury to the lung. COVID-19 is a thromboinflammatory condition resulting in an intense inflammatory reaction and widespread thrombosis as we have never seen before, not even in bacterial sepsis, nor in other viral infections like say H1N1. The incidence of thrombosis in mild disease has been shown to be about 11.1%. And in severe disease, among patients who require intensive care, the incidence may be as high as 29.4%. One of the biggest unknowns about this coagulation problem is we do not know to this day as to how long this problem may persist for. And the second question is, do you need to treat them with anticoagulation? What sort of patients will require anticoagulation? How long do you con need to continue with anticoagulation? None of these questions are satisfactorily answered at this point of time. So particularly in patients who are on anticoagulation, the anesthetists should bear in mind that excessive bleeding may happen and you may need to keep blood products ready in case that happens. And of course, in the post-operative period, there is a higher incidence of thrombosis, DVT, 
And pulmonary embolism, as you see here, saddle embolus, one of our patients. So you need to stick to an enhanced recovery protocol to ensure that thrombotic complications in the post-operative period are kept down to a minimum level. Renal dysfunction may not be very common in COVID-19 as a primary problem, but many of these patients who are on long-term ventilation get sepsis, particularly from multi-resistant organisms. And we've been using a plethora of antibiotics in many of these patients, including meropenem to start with, colistin, phosphomycin. Some patients have developed Elizabethan King gear required bacterium. So all sorts of infections, and they very often develop septic shock with hemodynamic compromise. And that very often results in acute kidney injury. Some of these patients may have persisting renal dysfunction. Of course, many of them require renal replacement therapy in the acute phase, and they go on to develop persisting dysfunction, which may persist for a prolonged period of time. And the anesthetists, again, must be aware of this fact and modify anesthetic management appropriately in the presence of renal dysfunction. So to summarize, even among patients who survive and do reasonably well after COVID-19, even among youngsters, there may be significant disability. Neurological problems are common, brain fog, ranging from brain fog to severe psychiatric problems, including post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, confusion, and other symptoms. Profound neuromuscular weakness very often happens, particularly in patients who require long-term ventilation with the use of neuromuscular blockade. And these patients should be carefully monitored with neuromuscular, with monitoring of neuromuscular blockade intra-op, ensure that they're reversed adequately. Lung is very often involved with severe COVID-19. Although they recover to a reasonable function, many of these patients have residual damage. And you should keep your eye open and perform appropriate tests, including lung function testing, and perhaps even CT scan to assess the degree of involvement of the lung. COVID-19 is a thrombogenic disease. We do not know till how long the propensity for thrombogenesis exists. And many of these patients may develop clot in the post-operative period. And you should maybe continue anticoagulation for an extended period of time and resort to an enhanced recovery protocol to make sure they're up and moving early enough. Cardiac involvement may be asymptomatic, may be very subtle. It may be reasonable to perform echocardiography, especially among older subjects who may have some baseline cardiac involvement as well. Persisting renal dysfunction may remain a challenge. And to the anesthetist, this is something again that you should bear in mind when you handle patients who have recovered from COVID-19. Thanks very much for listening.